Now, if a creationist were trying to write the story themselves, they could hardly do a better job. He continues, adding another significant point here in a lecture uh, recorded at SMU University. Since the so-called Cambrian explosion, no new phyla of animals have entered the fossil record. So at the beginning, you've got more than you have today. It's dwindled down. But all that you have today are there, and there have been no new ones since. When it starts, you've got it all, and it's been going downhill since then, is really basically what he's saying. Now, that is not what the evolutionist would predict. We can summarize this way from quotes from the evolutionist. We won't take time to document all of these in this presentation, but we have these in handouts. The, they were complex, as Dawkins says. They, were, uh, they appeared suddenly right at the start, as if they were just planted there in advanced form without an evolutionary history. We find land plants. Now, many of the, the earth science textbooks will tell us that uh, during the Cambrian, there's nothing but shallow seas everywhere. Well, if you've got 60 genera of land plants, that's obviously not the case. In fact, there are six groups of vascular plants described as advanced in the literature. Vascular plants are like trees, the woody types. Uh, obviously, there has to be land somewhere. This is what we find in this lowest part. All the major anatomical designs, as Gould says, the chordata, the highest order, all of its major divisions. We have vertebrates now, which many thought didn't belong and wouldn't be in this lowest order, lowest uh, layer, from uh, Wyoming, from Oklahoma, from Washington, Nevada, Idaho, Arkansas. Uh, we have them from, in fact, this is documented from 1978, though you still don't see that acknowledged in many of the geology textbooks. And then Google says, since this beginning of this, in this lowest part of the lowest layer, you have no new phyla. They are all there to start with. Now, just be honest about this. What does this look like? Uh, which model is served best? Is that a difficult question? In the critical part, the beginning of the geologic record, which would be most distinctive, that is, to distinguish the creation model from the evolution, you look and you see very different <laughs> from the evolutionist just exactly what the creationist would predict, just as almost as if we had written the story, and yet these acknowledgments are from the leading authorities in evolution. Not only do we see this sudden, complex, diverse beginning right from the start, as you continue upward, you see that there are separate and distinct kinds throughout the record, not this progressive continuum. Quoting here from Discover Magazine of a few years ago, they're describing this lowest part and then uh, the, the continuing fossil record. Uh, this demonstrates, we're told, that large animal phyla of today were present already in the early Cambrian and that they were as distinct from each other as today. Now, they're not just gradually leading one from one to the other. They're just as distinct as you see today. A menagerie of clam cousins, sponges, segmented worms, other invertebrates that would seem vaguely familiar to any scuba diver. Now, mostly invertebrates at the bottom of the ocean, which I think is the environment we're looking at. But we do have vertebrates there. But they're the kind of things that any scuba diver would recognize and they're separate and distinct right from the start, just as they are today. Where's this progressive continuum that we're looking, that the evolutionist would be looking for? We read from Valentine and Irwin, two of the leading evolutionary biologists in the world, writing in their textbook development. If we were to expect to find ancestors to our, or intermediates between higher taxa, it would be in the rocks of the late Precambrian or Ordovician time. These are the earliest uh, Precambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician, the, the earliest. That's where you'd expect to find the ancestors of the higher taxa. But that's when the bulk of the world's higher uh, animal taxa evolved, he believes, right there at the start. Yet traditional alliances are unknown or unconfirmed for any of the phyla or classes appearing in them. Now, Gould acknowledged they were all right in the Cambrian explosion, the lowest part of the Cambrian. He widens all the way up to and including the Ordovician, but even including that, you find no connecting branches. You find unknown intermediates uh, for any of the phyla or classes. They're not connected. They're separate and distinct, and this is their acknowledgment. Yet, when you look in the biology textbook, what do you see? 
you see the tree of life and they're all connected. Well, they're not connected in the fossil record. They're distinct and separate. The lines are drawn by the evolutionist and arranged in this pattern because that's the theory. That's not what the fossil record tells us. In fact, Stephen Gould says the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of the fossils. So when you see these connected branches, these trees of life, understand, even the leading evolutionists acknowledge, this is not what the fossil record says. This is very different. They have connected it uh, in the textbook. But what causes them to connect it in this manner? What allows them to arrange it this way? Well, not the fossils. What did do it? Uh, well, before we get to that point, notice Gould acknowledging that what you really find in the beginning is this broad, diverse picture, very much like the top of the tree. If you turn it upside down, it would be closer. He says the sweep of anatomical diversity reached a maximum right after the initial diversification. Right at the beginning, you've got more diverse kinds than later. He says the later history of life proceeded by elimination, not expansion. It started broad, it went downhill. That is, uh, more phyla were eliminated as you proceeded. But how do you get this tree? Well, Dot and uh, Batten, in their book Evolution of the Earth, acknowledge this. We have arranged the groups in a traditional way with the simplest forms first and progressively more forms, uh, complex forms following. This particular arrangement is arbitrary and depends on what definition of complexity you wish to choose. So they just arranged it that way because, of course, they have great faith in the evolutionary theory. But to be completely fair to them, that when they say it's arbitrary, they don't mean that there's no basis of it. They do have a basis, but that basis is different with different authorities. In that sense, the, the different authorities arbitrarily say it went our way. But the basic principle that guides it he goes on to say, is because things are alike, or, or involves the, the idea that things are alike because they're related. The less they look alike, the further removed they are from their common ancestor. That's how they build the tree. Things get put close together because they look alike, and then by that means of comparing similarities, you build this progressive continuum in spite of the distinct separate kinds that you see in the fossil record. Well, we look at the fossil record and we see similarities, don't we? They're absolutely undeniable. And when you talk about fossils, you just have to talk about similarities if you're going to make any sense out of it, certainly in terms of evolution. Otherwise, you just have billions of dead things and rocks. So you line them up by looking at similarities. We look at the ape and the man. Can anyone deny the similarity? I don't think any honest person could. The question is, why are they similar? Now, the fact that you can see one possibility doesn't mean there are not others and other better explanations. When we drive down the subdivision, we see houses that are similar, for example, and that's not because they're cousins. We see common genetics is not a very good explanation here. Obviously, common designer explains better. And when we look at the living world, we see designs, I believe, as Gould had indicated uh, inadvertently, and that would indicate a common designer that at least explains similarities as well. But I think when we look more closely at the similarities in the real world, we see a distinct advantage with one of these explanations. These similarities of the, uh, the hand uh, of the mammal, so to speak, uh, are supposed to be as a result of genetics, inheriting common genes. But what we have found from genetics is this is not the case. Sir Gavin De Beer is one of the leading authorities in that field. And here in the Oxford Biology Reader, he says it's now clear that the pride with which it was assumed that the inheritance of homologous structures from a common ancestor explain homology was misplaced. Homology involves this concept of uh, similarities that indicate evolution inherited from common genes. In fact, that's the way Darwin defined it. That's what homology is, similarities that come from common genes. Well, we thought the common genetics explained this. He says that pride was misplaced. 
he continues saying, for such inheritance cannot be ascribed to identity of genes.